Hello, America. I'm Mark Levin. This is Life, Liberty, and Levin with our great guest, Heather McDonald. How are you? Fine. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for having me on. Well, you have a BA and MA in English. You have a JD. You're a lawyer. Uh, but you're a scholar in so many areas, uh, race relations, uh, immigration, policing, in colleges and universities, and this is where I really wanted to delve in with you. You have a brand new book, The Diversity Delusion, How Race and Gender Pandering Corrupt the University and Undermine Our Culture. This is so relevant today. And you argue that toxic ideas first spread by higher education have undermined humanistic values, fueled intolerance, and widened divisions in our larger culture. And I think we see this everywhere now. We but, certainly do. Yeah. The Kavanaugh hearings was an example that we're all in Gender Studies 101 now, Mark. Uh, virtually every aspect of the culmination of hysteria that greeted uh, Judge Kavanaugh was perfected over the last decade on a college campus. Above all, the preposterous mantra to believe survivors, regardless of the evidence, regardless of due process. This is the campus rape hysteria that has been transforming the lives of males on campuses, creating an extraordinarily costly bureaucracy, moved into the real world, and it's not going away. It's only going to get worse. What have our universities and colleges become, and when did this happen? I mean, they were always kind of liberal in the last several decades, but in some ways, and not my phrase, now, they're, they're almost sort of a Soviet-style system where there really isn't free speech. You're not allowed to challenge uh, the so-called norms in the universities, where race and, 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 and gender seem to have uh, a priority over other, other things and that sort of thing. When did all this happen? Well, it... The 80s was when it started, in my view. That's when you got radical multiculturalism that hit. I was in college in the 70s. I'm very grateful for that because I was allowed to read John Milton, William Wordsworth, and Shakespeare without anyone thinking to complain about the gonads and melanin of those authors. I got to lose myself in beauty, in greatness, and sublimity. Come the 80s, and students were given a license for ignorance. They were taught that the only thing they needed to know about a book was the race and gender of the author to know whether it was thoroughly dismissible without even being read, uh, and they could go on to instead wallow in their own delusional oppression. And it has only gotten worse since then. And what we are doing is breeding the grounds for, I fear, civil war, because students are being taught to hate to hate the greatest works of Western civilization, and frankly, to hate each other. From the moment a student steps on college campus today as a freshman, or a fresh person, I should probably say, the bureaucracy is determined to, to drum into that student's head identity politics, which says he's either a victim or an oppressor. Oppressors are obviously, most famously, white males, heterosexual white males. The only way they can get out of their oppressor category is to become an ally, an ally of the oppressed. The, the most preposterous delusion of all of this is students actually believe that they are at risk of their lives from circumambient racism and sexism on a college campus. This is an environment that, in traditional liberal terms, is the most tolerant environment in human history for society's traditionally marginalized groups. Yet there's a massive bureaucracy dedicated to cultivating in students this delusional sense of their own oppression, which then they carry with them. It's a chip on their shoulder that prevents them from seizing the magnificent opportunities to learn to, to read every book that's ever been written. And they carry this chip, this delusional victimology, into the world at large. And they are going around blaming American institutions of endemic racism and sexism when that no longer is true. You see it with respect to professors and tenure. You see certain professors are sort of drummed out of the classroom. You see the rise in confrontation, physical confrontation on college campuses. You see that the commencement speakers are almost totally of the left. Uh, and you see when some 
conservatives dare to go to a college campus and want to speak about things that are really not particularly controversial, um, how often you have to bring in the riot police or, or the security guards have to come into the facility. Um, the administrators, are these the old 60s, 1960s retread types, or who are these people? Yeah, the administrators are even more left-wing than the faculty. Uh, and they are part of this massive bureaucracy. If, if students are wondering, why is my college tuition so expensive? Look no further than the diversity bureaucracy. At the University of California at Los Angeles, their vice chancellor for equity, diversity, and inclusion makes over $400,000 $400, a year. This is mind-boggling. This is multiples more than your average faculty member makes. It could, it could pay for free tuition for four years for 12 undergraduates. And that vice chancellor of equity, diversity, and inclusion has nothing to do because there isn't a single bigot in, on a university campus today. Every faculty search is one desperate effort to find qualified females or so-called underrepresented minorities, this refers to blacks and Hispanics, who haven't already been snapped up by better endowed schools. So what do the vice chancellors of diversity, equity, inclusion do? Because they're certainly not routing circumambient racism and sexism. What they're doing is drumming into students' head this false narrative of victimology. And what is amazing to me is that colleges are somehow held harmless for their rising tuitions. The, the solution that's always bandied about in public discourse is, well, more federal aid. No, don't feed the beast. Cut the bureaucracy, get back to the basics of learning, which now is a distant afterthought. No faculty has the guts to say, we know what you should learn, you're ignorant, we're here to put knowledge in your empty noggins. Instead, students are given utter carte blanche to decide what to study. The faculty have abdicated their intellectual responsibility. And as you say, we're in a very weird situation where speakers such as myself, uh, who, who was prevented from talking about policing at Claremont McKenna College, uh, when I need a police escort to come onto a college campus, an alarm bell should be going off in the faculty's ear saying, something's wrong here. But instead, the faculty are nowhere to be found. Let me ask you this. So why do we passively subsidize this through our taxes, through tuition, through student loans? You know, you have Bernie Sanders out there saying, free college for everybody. Well, of course. These are, as you're saying, more indoctrination mills right. more than anything else. So free college and... Obama with, you know, the federal government should assume all the student debt. So they talk about college as if it really is academic rather than, in so many respects, propaganda-oriented. They know about this then. They know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. It bleeds into the greater society, doesn't it? It bleeds into politics. It bleeds into the media. Some of the things you're talking about I see in the media. I see with anchors on TV. I see with commentators on TV. Well... Identity politics is everywhere. I am so sick of hearing somebody preface his remarks by saying, well, as a white female or as a black female, X, Y, Z. I'm sorry, that's a non sequitur. It is not the case that I can predict your views knowing that you're a white male. I cannot predict your views if you were a black female. And it is the height of both arrogance and, and condescension to think that somebody can be typecasted on the base of that. But of course, that is now the currency of the political realm. Uh, so it is certainly bled into politics. The Democratic Party now is an extension of this poisonous identity politics on college campuses. And to be honest, I can only hope it continues because Americans by and large are not buying it. But the thing that worries me the most, Mark, is what this is doing to our scientific advantage in the so-called STEM fields. This is the science, technology, engineering, and math. For a while, people who were optimists thought, well, okay, 
you got the gender studies here, you got the women's studies there, you got the Chicana studies there. It's all going to stay put. Science will be the one realm that remains committed to meritocracy because we all understand, of course, that there's no such thing as female physics. There's no such thing as Iranian physics. There's physics. There's math. This is the accomplishment of human reason that is open to everybody. Well, that was a false hope. Anybody that knew anything about the university would have known it's not safe. And now you have nothing less than the National Science Foundation, a federal agency that is the premier funder of basic research on college campuses that has itself been colonized by this poisonous identity politics. The National Science Foundation is spending billions of our taxpayer dollars funding gender theorists on college campuses to study so-called intersectionality and microaggressions in the STEM fields on the assumption that the only possible explanation for why we do not have 50-50 gender parity in our engineering departments and math departments must be, by definition, the result of sexism. That is the diversity delusion. That is the, the fundamental lie that we've been fed, that any disparity in a representation, whether it's a gender disparity or race disparity, must be the result of discrimination. And so our STEM fields now right. are, are obsessed with gender, gender equity and race equity. So it also is an attack, as you write, on competition, obviously. Right. And on merit. It is. And so we kind of dumb down our society. We tribalize our society. We balkanize our society. Um, who does this benefit? <laughs> well, it benefits the bureaucracy because let's start again with the college campus, but it goes into corporations as well. On a college campus, students are being taught to hate. They're being taught to think of themselves as victims. I would argue this is a side issue we can get or, or can't get into. Racial preferences, which are a poisonous uh, policy feed into this uh, in complex ways. But every time that students hold these protests like brown students occupying the president's office saying, well, it's very hard to have to go to class and, and study for exams because we're working so hard at, quote, staying alive at brown. This is preposterous. This is delusional. But every time there's a little outbreak of student hysteria, the diversity bureaucracy walks in and says, well, we need more diversity bureaucrats. And sadly, the students agree, and they inevitably ask for more vice chancellors of equity, diversity. But you also brought up the Kavanaugh hearings. And so what I'm getting at is when you indoctrinate people this way, right. when you affect their thinking this way, I mean, eventually they leave college and mm -hmm. they leave a university. Sure and they go out into the broader world. And I feel like the Democrat Party plays into this. I feel like the Democrat Party plays into this, more and more the media play into this, because a lot of these people in politics more and more, and in the media more and more, come out of this mindset, do they not? Well, yeah, the media believes, again, that race and gender determine everything. Uh, there's not a single mainstream media outlet that is not uh, determining what stories to cover, who to source them to, who to quote, who to put by, who to write them that is not looking at race and gender on the assumption that uh, those attributes determine our world, that America is profoundly racist, profoundly sexist, and they're seeking stories that they think support that narrative. Uh, and it's also in corporations, HR departments, you know, one of the main uh, milestones that show how much the university identity politics is transforming our competitive edge was when Google fired a young computer engineer named James Damore in August of 2017. Damore wrote a factual, reasoned-based, 10-page memo simply questioning the feminist orthodoxy that reigns at Google. He was fired. Well, one of the interesting comments on the Google chat board said, we need to stop this diversity uh, madness before it goes any further. Right now, our HR department is simply an outpost of gender studies and black studies. All right. 
Don't forget, folks, almost every weeknight you can watch Levin TV. Levin TV, I'll be there at CRTV.com, CRTV.com. We'd love you to join us. Just give us a call at 844-LEVIN-TV, 844-LEVIN-TV. We'll be right back. Heather McDonald, you've talked about how these ideas t tear at the American fabric. But they have real-world consequences, not only in our politics, not only in our media, but in competition with countries, China, Russia, and so forth. Explain. Well, China is ruthlessly meritocratic. It doesn't give a damn about identity politics. It wants the best engineers and the best physics. If they're all female, great. If they're all male, great. Who cares? The United States is diverting vast sums of money into trying to engineer gender parity in its labs. Meanwhile, China is racing ahead with ruthless competitive drive. We are putting our competitive edge at risk. Right now we're still ahead, but do not assume that that is going to last forever if we continue to put these irrelevancies of gender above all else and race to a lesser extent ahead of scientific competitiveness. Uh, because, again, it's not just China, it's also Russia. Uh, they are spending 100% of their science research money on doing science. We are devoting ever-increasing percentage into gender politics, whether it's at MIT, Harvard, UC Berkeley, or whether it's coming out of, of Congress through the National Science Foundation, this has to be stopped. This has to be stopped. You've got almost a monopoly ideology on these college campuses. You're getting to a point of a monopoly ideology in our newsrooms. Right. In the Democrat Party, you have almost a monopoly ideology. There aren't many so-called centrists or moderates left, certainly very few conservatives left. This is quite daunting, isn't it? It is daunting, uh, and but one has to fight for truth against falsehood. How do you do that? Well, I think, for one, we need to defund the universities. Alumni have to stop giving money. Realize that these schools, you have a false ideal about them. They are, again, generators of ideology, not of, of wisdom. Uh, and and there needs to be alternative venues of the support of classical learning and the humanities. But I think, frankly, and certainly we need to talk about the value of free speech, but the free speech problem is a symptom of something much more deep, which is this cultivation of victimology. I think what also needs to be done, Mark, and this may be a false hope, I don't hear enough voices providing an alternative explanation for why there is not necessarily 50-50 gender parity in a math department. Uh, right now, the, the sole explanation out there is implicit bias, that females are somehow being discouraged from studying math. The fact is, the, the countries with the most gender equity have the greatest disparities in STEM because, on average, females and males are interested in different types of work. Males, on average, and there's always individual differences. You can't assume anything about an individual based on an average, but on average, males are more attracted to abstract work, to competition. They're higher risk, risk of, uh, prone. Females want more hands-on, uh, relational human-based work. So I do not expect that a people working for the Nobel Prize in physics or earning it in math are going to be 50-50 uh, gender. And I'm also willing to talk about something that is very taboo, Mark, which is that skills are not evenly distributed among different groups. High-end math skills, if you look at the 0.01% of the highest-end math skills, and also the dummies, who are the worst math clods? It's males. Who are the greatest math geniuses? 0.01% of the highest end math skills, males outnumber females 2.5 to 1. So Larry Summers, when he was president of Harvard, dared 
talk about this distribution of math skills. He got fired. We have to keep talking about that, though, because they dominate the 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 explanation for in inequalities or lack of parity is always racism or sexism. We have to fight that. Let's overlay this with immigration. Now. Yeah. Because um, if diversity based on physical characteristics and so forth is is the key, which takes place in colleges and universities and more and more in the broader society, this complicates it even further because people coming into this country, many of whom are we'd consider minorities uh, south of the border, uh, Asia, Africa, the Middle East, um, how do we account for that? In other words, when I see these statistics about the percentage of the population that is this group, mm -hmm. and why aren't they part of this group? Well, some of them are first generation. Some of them haven't even assimilated into the country yet. So, so many of these statistics are bogus to begin with. And aren't we teaching people who come into this country, newly come into this country, the wrong thing? Shouldn't we be teaching assimilation, the American culture, meritocracy, as you put it, and so forth? And yet I don't see us doing that. No, of course not. Assimilation is now a dirty word. You cannot speak about that on a college campus. Uh, and what I find most interesting is the way Asians are, are tending. Uh, the, right now, to be a victim in, in the United States is to be the highest elite position you can occupy. Power ironically flows from being a victim. You have this ruthlessly competitive drive to see who can be top victim, top dog victim. And it's, it's, it's mano a mano. People are pulling each other down. You know, now the top victim is trans, but I can guarantee you in another five years, trans is going to be pulled down and there'll be somebody else on top victim. And anybody who can predict that gets the prize. So you were talking about the and Asian Asians, community. Asians are the most academically competitive because the academic culture at home is so strong. And yet, a large percentage of Asians are saying, well, don't call us the model minority. Uh, we want to be people of color against whites. You have a lot of Asians that are voting Democratic that actually support racial preferences in universities uh, because even though it acts against them. Asians are the ones that are most, most penalized by racial preferences. Well, let, let me slow down there. You don't see that at Harvard. The a Asian community, or part of it, is challenging. A small the part. But they're challenging the admissions at Harvard because they're being discriminated against because it's not based on merit. Right. And so this is a problem for that community. But I don't even like this kind of talk. That community, that this. We so dehumanize uh, humanity. We dehumanize the individual is what I'm trying to say. We'll be right back. <music> Heather McDonald, we've seen this caravan, this invasion that's been taking place for a period of time. Uh, the president wants to put an end to it. Um, I, I look at this and I think to myself, shouldn't the nation be united in wanting to secure the border, whether you're for immigration, opposed to immigration? This is a law and order matter. This is a sovereignty matter. And when you see these pictures in the video of individuals throwing rocks, throwing bottles at ICE, at our law enforcement, and yet there is a significant percentage of our society, including members of Congress, including people in the media, including so-called scholars, who don't denounce this. In fact, they denounce the president for trying to resolve it. What do you make of that? It's remarkable. It is, it is a, a divide that I cannot even get over. I can sometimes put myself in the shoes of the left on other matters, but on this one, it seems so obvious that you do not, nobody is entitled to enter any other country illegally. I am not entitled to walk into Germany and say, you know, take me in. Uh, this is a fundamental right of citizens to determine themselves who comes in and who doesn't. It, so it's a matter of principle. We can also say, as a matter of consequences, if you lose that right, uh, the, the migration flows that are going to take place into the United States would absolutely crush us. You know, Milton Friedman famously said, you cannot have a welfare state and open borders. You will destroy a country. 
And I look at this and I say to myself, it's really in recent times that people try to break into your country carrying the flag of the country they come from and then claim that they want asylum. And then to have people in the United States, people of prominence, public officials, media figures, and so forth, excusing it while they're hungry, while they want a better life, well this, well that. Okay, so if somebody robs a bank because they need money to pay their mortgage, that's okay. If somebody goes in a grocery store and steals a whole bunch of steaks because they need to feed their children, that's okay. There is a breakdown in uh, respect for law and order, whether it's immigration, whether it's Baltimore, right. or any of these, uh, or any of these types of uh, situations. Why is that? Well, you know, we have this ideology of you do not blame the victim. And so what you're saying is absolutely correct. That has been a factor in the left-wing culture for a long time, that if you get to claim victim status, you are absolved from following the rules. You can colonize, you can, you know, defecate on the street because, well, you're a victim. Uh, you can steal because you're a victim. You can shoot other people because you're a victim. Do not apply. We have given up on the idea of a single moral standard for all people. Obviously, for the Democrats, when it comes to immigration, uh, there is a belief that the more third world people of color that they bring in, uh, the more they get a larger base for identity politics. I think what is driving this as well is some just profound hatred uh, for Western civilization, which is perceived as being a function of white males. And so there's a desire to somehow deluge it uh, and and destroy what what created just extraordinary advances in human well-being, prosperity, reason, uh, and 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 obviously affluence. Um, but you know what I find so extraordinary is the left in the morning has one narrative, which is that there is no place more oppressive on earth than the United States for people of color. It's just, if you're a person of color in the United States, you are the subject of constant oppression. And in the afternoon says, we need every third world person of color to come here. Well, they can't both be true. Why is it that so many people in the third world are begging, they are breaking the law to come into the United States because they'll be oppressed? The ACLU should be saying, the ACLU in its morning mode should be saying to those third world people of color, stay put, you're much better off and you're freer and you're more affluent and nobody's going to kill you by oppression in your third world person of color uh, country. Instead, they all want them to come in. So it's a completely incoherent ideology that can only be unpacked by understanding that the agenda here ultimately is to try and bring down Western civilization. When we come back, I want to pursue that again. Why would there be forces in this country that live in the lap of luxury, that live in the lap of liberty, that live in the lap of law and order, justice, yeah. trying to destroy it? I think that's the big question. Ladies and gentlemen, don't forget, most weeknights you can watch me on Levin TV, Levin TV. I hope you'll join us. Go to CRTV.com slash Mark, CRTV.com slash Mark, or give us a call at 844-LEVIN-TV. That's 844-LEVIN-TV. We'll be right back. We do need to ask the question, I do. Why would there be such powerful forces in this country that want to destroy these various instrumentalities of liberty, these constitutional standards and so forth. And let me give you my idea. Isn't it because that's the nature of progressivism? Progressivism is the really the progeny of Marxism, of Hegel, of Rousseau, that they've told us this. John Dewey told us this. Uh, Woodrow Wilson told us this. Many of them told us this. The intellectuals beginning of the last century. And they tell us this today. Pretty much. That is, we need a clean slate. So this country was founded by slave owners. It's got to be destroyed. The Constitution's okay if we can use it to get where we want to go. 
liberty is good as long as we can exploit liberty to get to where we want to go. And so they talk about radical egalitarianism, college for all, health care for all. And this isn't new. We've seen it in all these societies uh, that, that basically destroy liberty and empower government, centralize government. It's the same story. Relative few control the society while they claim to be populists and reformers and so forth. Isn't that the scent of what's taking place here? Well, that's certainly part of it, and, and because it is true that you can say Marxism, at least in its embodiment in China and Russia, China at least was not really a Western phenomenon. To me, what I notice about our world, too, is that the peculiarity of American culture and Western European culture in general being so self-hating. Uh, this is, I think, relatively new in human experience for a culture to want to uh, claim that its own basis is founded in, in injustice rather than celebrating itself. Traditionally, maybe to a fault, uh, countries and civilizations celebrated strength and accomplishment and power uh, and, and maybe not enough appreciated other cultures. We're the opposite. It is a very corrosive but very weird development in human history for the, the elites to be so dedicated to a, a narrative of guilt and shame. Uh, and one can seek an explanation in ultimate power, as you say, that the progressive elites are seeking to control society uh, and to impose, I guess, a radical, radical egalitarian agenda. But one has to ask, like, well, why is that? And it's complicated. I think for America, obviously, uh, we did have an original sin uh, at the start of this country, which was our treatment of blacks. And it was very ugly and very hard for us to understand now how we could go for so many decades without seeing that fundamental contradiction. Many people did, and you know, one can say that even at the start the Constitution foresaw that eventually this contradiction would be reconciled and worked out. Nevertheless, uh, it's understandable that we're guilty. Now Shelby Steele on your program was very eloquent about saying it's time to move beyond that and realize that that we now provide equal opportunity and the opportunity for individuals to seize their own fate and better themselves through the exercise of bourgeois values. But but a large part of, of society wants to hold on to that guilt, exploit it, and uh, continue with the idea that oppression is the defining characteristic. I mean, to me, the, the greatest exponent of these today is this highly sought after college speaker Ta-Nehisi Coates, who is making just untold sums going around telling America, telling white America that the very essence of America is to destroy the black body. Not in the 19th century, but today. And people love it. You know, he goes to, he goes to these all white colleges and tells them, you, the essence of you people is to destroy us, and people cheer. It's, it's a very, very weird thing. Mm -hmm. And yet I don't think it's, it's unique in the sense that you have the greatest country, really, that mankind has ever established, where this is sort of rotting from within. Uh -huh. um, and yet others have too, whether it's Athens or Rome and so forth. I don't compare us to them, I'm just saying. For a different are, reason. A different I, re I don't think they were saying, we are, the, we are the oppressors on earth. But they didn't need to. They just rotted from within because of the way they treated each other and the way they, uh, and the way they rejected their own initial founding. And so, but that said, it's, 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 I'm not comfortable just standing, staying with, it's weird, because it is weird. Because it's well too advanced, it's too ubiquitous, in my view, to leave it at weird. I'm not saying there's a conspiracy, I'm saying there's an ideology. Uh -huh. there's an the ideology. ideology is the ideology and it tells us what the ideology is. 
What's past is bad. Right. What's today is bad. Right. Only the future counts. And only we, the masterminds, can form the, 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 the future. We've seen it in other societies, in other forms, and in other ways. And that's part of the puzzle of America, isn't it? We have freedom, which allows people to do things to this country and in this country that I think can be extremely destructive. We'll be right back. Heather McDonald, if we don't secure our border, even 90, 95 percent secure the border, know who's coming, vet them, uh, if we don't recognize that we are a sovereign nation, a nation state with borders, and for people who come here even legally, if we don't assimilate people generally into our culture, into our language, into our communities, where are we going to be? That's, you cease to become, you cease to be a country, right? Sure, you become nothing. I mean, what the main problem is this large, unchecked, uh, low-skilled immigration flow that is imposing enormous costs on the country in terms of welfare, schooling, prison construction, policing, uh, and is bringing a... They don't have the social capital. And what I've documented is the creation of a second underclass where a lot of the kids of these illegal immigrants who are coming from largely peasant culture, instead of, again, because we're not having an argument or a narrative about assimilation, they're being sucked into gang culture. Uh, you have the highest out-of-wedlock teen birth rate among Hispanics, highest dropout rate from high schools among Hispanics. Many are succeeding. They're starting businesses, but a significant number is is getting sucked into oppositional values into sort of a gangster mentality. Uh, and that is creating greater social divisions, uh, and it's costing taxpayers enormous amount of money. They, s the Americans can see what happens, you know, in, in many communities when you have illegal uh, people coming in, gang crime goes up. This is, this is not an illusion. Uh, and so it is the right of any any citizen body. It's not just Americans. Mexico, nobody else has birthright citizenship for illegal aliens. You want to see border controls? Look at what Mexico does try to do, unless it's a caravan that's going through on the en route to the United States. But every other country in this hemisphere understands that borders count, except when it's people going to the, the magnet that we've got. And of course, that's the other problem uh, with not enforcing the rule of law, is it sends an invitation. The biggest deterrence to people coming illegally is the knowledge that there will be consequences. The sanctuary city movement is one of the most appalling acts of political daring. It's, it's breathless in its in its uh, ambitions. What's going on there is they, the hard left open borders lobby is making the most difficult possible case, which is to say that an illegal alien criminal, somebody who's here illegally, goes on to break other criminal laws, that that person may not be deported. We'll be right back. Heather McDonald, I'm going to ask you the question I ask most guests. Where do you see this country in five or ten years? Well, we're either in civil war or we've gotten ourselves away from the brink of civil war. And we're in civil war if we do not fight back against identity politics. You mean a physical civil war? Yeah, I, I absolutely do. We've seen it already. We're seeing civil violence grow. Uh, people with impunity, with, with the celebration, the encouragement of politicians beating each other up. Antifa. Antifa, uh, you know, har harassing Tucker Carlson, harassing politicians. Uh, again, the universities are teaching students to hate on the basis of race and gender. Unless we counter that narrative, which originates in the view that America is oppressive to females, I can tell you I've never been oppressed in my life. I've been the subject of gender quotas in my alleged favor. Unless we fight that narrative of endemic racism, we're in civil war. All right. 
Well, on that note, it's been a great pleasure, Heather. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. See you next time on Life, Liberty, and Levin.